Good morning, everyone, to the second day of our conference. Um, it's my great pleasure to announce uh, our first speaker of the morning session, Bailok Hu, who is here from the University of Maryland. Bailok is, Bailok is an expert on so many things, quantum gravity among them, quantum field theory, on curved space-times, in the early universe, in non-equilibrium situations. Uh, he has thought a lot about quantum foundations uh, uh, too. And in addition, we are very grateful because he gave up one of his ironclad principles, with it, which is not to appear, not to waste his precious summer by going to conferences. So we are extra grateful that he's here today and we'll be talking about theoretical basis for low energy, quantum gravity and quantum information phenomenon. So welcome and thank you, Balog. Thank, thank you so much, uh, Anata, for your kind in, in introduction. I want to thank the organizers, uh, Frank, uh, Renata, Beatrice, for such a wonderful conference. Uh, it's one of the best I've attended, really. Um, for one, there's plenty of opportunity for young people to present their work, and I think that's a very uh, great thing to do. And even tending to details like uh, uh, missing power supply, <laughs> otherwise you would see a much earlier version of this. So uh, let me try to uh, capture the essence of a few things. How is the sound from, because I speak with a really weak voice, my students always complain about it, but you can adjust it whenever, yeah. All right, so I've divided it into three parts. The first part is pure philosophy. You wouldn't see any uh, equation in it. And basically, I'm just asking one question. That one question that I've been asking for the last maybe 30, 30 years or more. And I, because now quantum gravity has developed so much. And in fact, I'm trying to take this opportunity to find out the different answers to my one question that I'll post to you uh, in the first part. And the second part, uh, I'll just go through gravitational decoherence and gravitational uh, as two sample uh, issues wherein one could, in principle, carry out tabletop uh, experiments. Um, and in fact, that's you know, what stirred up a lot of uh, interest and attention uh, towards um, tabletop, in quote, uh, experiments for quantum gravity. Uh, one has to be really careful about what means, one means in quantum gravity there. And then the third part, uh, if I have enough time, uh, I'll also show you uh, another uh, topic which has to do with graviton noise. Uh, in some sense, people know that it's very difficult to directly detect gravitons. And they say, well, what about uh, whatever noise that it carries? And we show it's still kind of uh, minuscule, the effect, but at least those are a few avenues uh, representing low energy quest for the quantum nature of gravity. So, disclaimer. First of all, this talk is not about quantum experiments in gravity or analog gravity, uh, there are lots of nice reviews, as you can see. And I'm not an experimentalist, nor am I a versatile enough theorist capable of doing quality experiments. There are people who, who are capable of doing that. And this slide was prepared before I knew that Marcus Aspumaya can't come. I was hoping that he would fill in all the gaps about experiments, and you can ask him any question about it. Uh, well, you can do so for the next speaker, of course. And um, most importantly, this is not a review. Uh, again, there are many excellent reviews. I read the one that uh, you know, was mentioned, in fact, uh, discussed uh, very nicely by Bianca in the opening talk here. I would invite you to take a look at it uh, because the, the perspective has changed so much compared to, let's say, 30 years ago. And I also want to remind you that so-called tabletop could be as big, the table could be as big as LIGO Virgo, 400 uh, meters, uh, kilometers, 
or even uh, stretching to deep space like DSQL. That's the, the newest NASA uh, initiative um, while well, preparing to put men on Mars through um, man station, uh, person station uh, around the moon, that sort of thing. Um, and so, in a way, uh, you know, never mind about whether the tabletop specific experiments that you've read about it is about quantum gravity at the Planck scale. They are not. I just want to tell you they're not. At best, it's per perturbative. And in fact, even not <laughs> perturbative in the sense that if you only look at Newtonian force, it's pure gauge. You cannot talk about the quantum or the classical nature because it's slave to the, uh, the masses in the case of ENM is the Coulomb force being the pure gauge. You really need to get to the level of photons to talk about the quantum nature of it. So, but I, what I was referring to is that it's worth paying attention to some of these large scale experiments, which I would also consider that as tabletop, all right? So you might wonder at this point, what am I doing here, right? It's not a review, it's not about experiment. So instead, I like to discuss some fundamental theoretical issues of low energy and emphatically perturbative quantum gravity when quantum information issues like decoherence and entanglement are invoked in any proposed tabletop experiment, okay? So it's mainly the theoretical basis that I'm focusing on. And so I mentioned there are reviews, and there's one uh, quite recently. Uh, I'm going to skip over some of these things, but if uh, there's a chance that this uh, talk, the slides, could be uh, made public, then whoever wants to get into the details can look at the, de the, the references. Uh, here, this is the reference list from this review paper that I just show you. And continuing on, you can find some of the familiar uh, <coughs> papers here. And so let me start per part one. Quantum gravity, I keep asking people what is quantum gravity. It's kind of a silly question uh, to the, the, an audience of experts here. But I think there's uh, is something that's worth uh, thinking or reconsidering. Uh, what I found over the last 30 years, or more in fact 40, uh, there is something in agreement that is quantum gravity uh, theories refers to theories for the microscopic structure of space-time. Okay. If uh, you think this is otherwise, uh, maybe in the question period we could uh, delve into that further. It's a noble quest, it's the same noble quest, but the approaches and methods towards this lofty goal differ widely, uh, which is why the different ways are quite well represented in this conference. Right? Now the conventional approach started from the 50s of the last century uh, as practice mostly in the GR, general relativity community, is to quantize the metric or the connection form. All right. Now, this is the question I raised and the reason why I haven't written one paper on quantum gravity. And that is, we know general relativity works very well in the description of the large scale structure and dynamics of space time. And metrics and connections are macroscopic variables, as far as we could tell. Uh, in fact, it works marvelously well for larger scales, uh, well, cosmology. Why do you believe that quantizing these variables will reveal the microscopic structures? That was the question I was asking myself and everybody else for the longest time. Well, people usually say, look at EM field, you know, gravity is similar to it, yes. Helium-4, yes, but is this a universal paradigm? No. Universal meaning it applies to all cases, and the answer is no. Quantization of a collective variable does not lead to microstructure, okay? So what are collective variables? Well, there's abundance of examples in condensed metaphysics which deals mainly with the dynamics of collective variables of atomic interactions. 
So there they know what the microscopic structure is, the atoms, we all know. But they are more concerned with the collective uh, degrees of freedom in its multifarious manifestations, like phonons, rotons, plasmons, excitons. There are so many ON endings, right? So one can quantize sound, for example, and study the interaction of phonons with the electrons. That's the second chapter in any condensed matter textbook. Okay. So these ONs are all quantum entities, but does quantum imply microscopic? Certainly not. So a crucial question to ask, more important than quantization, at least for me, <laughs> for the last 30, 40 years, is the following. Are metric and connection forms fundamental? depicting the microscopic constituents at the Planck scale, or are the collective variables constructed from them? The them we don't know yet, and that's what the noble quest I referred to earlier. So then the question becomes, is general relativity an effective theory valid only at large scales or low energies, like hydrodynamics with respect to molecular dynamics? And we, in this latter case, we know pretty well how to derive hydrodynamics from molecular dynamics uh, via conveniently kinetic theory in between. So kinetic theory is kind of a mesoscopic theory with respect to molecule molecular dynamics, the micro theory, and on the other hand, with respect to the macro theory, which is the hydrodynamics uh, theory form from it. All right, so this is the time to uh, sort of make clear uh, my own position uh, declaration. Uh, that was written in this essay, 1996. That's the second Sakharov conference. Because of Sakharov, I was uh, bold enough to put forth this theme, this thesis. And it was developed a little bit later in 2005. But ac actually, before that already, there are two essays uh, that I try to sort of shift people's viewpoint a little bit, uh, like cosmology as condensed metaphysics. And there's a long story behind all of this, because uh, at least in the 60s and 70s, when we were educated, uh, cosmology belongs firmly to the noble side, which is high energy physics, particle physics, general relativity, and all that. Condensed metaphysics, people say, ah, all right, that's easy. We know ENM, everything comes out from it. It's only later that I learned that that's certainly not true. Okay, there's a lot, and maybe, in fact, in cosmology, we need uh, some conception uh, that uh, uh, apply to uh, condensed metaphysics. Okay, so. In reference to quantum gravity, uh, general relativity is the nature, is of the nature of a hydrodynamic theory, valid only in the long wavelength, low energy limit of some microscopic theories at the Planck scale. So, in this uh, perspective, geometry and in particular the manifold structure, even manifold. For example, yesterday's talk, Kalabi Yao, what is it? Kähler manifold. So, my question is, if you have a pet theory about the microscopic constituents of space-time, that you firmly believe in it, I hope the first thing you can show us is where the manifold structure, the smooth structure, comes from. Okay, And that actually is a question uh, that's uh, not so easily sort of um, negotiate um, around. Uh, when, when you, for example, if you I go to a talk, say, string cosmology, and then the first line is some string, uh, and then the second line is the Friedman, Robson, Walker, space-time. I would say, where does that space-time come from? If you could show me through your string interactions where that space-time comes from, I would be much happier. Pay attention to that. Nothing wrong with it, but that's similar to the case of electron phone non uh, interaction. Okay, they have not quite addressed the issue head on. Okay, so in this viewpoint, space time is an emergent entity, so are its symmetries. Many of the symmetries that we're familiar with that we impose as necessary conditions, uh, they could be uh, emergent also. Okay, 
All right, so um, the other people who are, I, I should mention, Volovic and uh, Xiao Gang Wen, and certainly my colleague, uh, Ted uh, Jacobson, whose uh, sort of thermodynamic uh, uh, <laughs> approach is pe probably better known. Uh, so let's uh, push on. The alternative, and this is, of course, what this conference offers a lot to, right, is the posit. You say, this is the microscopic variable. If you don't believe it, I'm going to show you, okay? The first thing I would like whoever says that to show is where does the manifold structure uh, come from, or at least show us how it could be, you know, uh, derived from whatever uh, these basic constituents, uh, strings, loops, uh, groups, uh, sets, uh, synthesis, asymptotic safety, uh, and so on. And uh, I just want to emphasize there's so much work done in this uh, by some of the best people uh, in all directions. And um, in my proposing my viewpoint, in no sense do I belittle that. You see that, actually, we need both sides as physics progress. The progress of physics showed us uh, we need to make some assumptions about what's there, the fundamental structure, the basic constituents. Not unlike in the 60s, someone crazy enough to say, well, there are quarks. Of course, there's someone is Gelman, right? And then you have to work out, right, the quark, the flavor, dynamics, and so on. Ah, all right, at least some of the hadrons match what the scheme is. And, and I think, I hope this is what uh, my colleagues in these uh, various approaches are striving for, okay? So the question is, does your favorite theory depend on some background geometry? And if so, where does it come from, for example? All right, so this is a slide. Some of you might have seen this maybe even 20 years ago, uh, but I think it's still uh, useful. What's plotted here uh, on this side is classical, the other side is quantum, and then going vertically, it is micro going down to macro, right? So you can see general relativity uh, is situated here. It's a classical theory which applies really well in the description of the large-scale structure of the universe, for example, right? And traditionally, one th would think that, well, if I just quantize a classical variable, it would give me quantum, referring to the microscopic structure or the constituents of whatever theory that you're working with. In this case, space-time in particular, right? So I've listed some of these uh, uh, approaches there. So basically, the one question I was asking refers to there's a drop-down list. I mean, now we work with computers. If you click here, there's a drop-down list, which is from micro to macro. And so if we th think about our starting point, that is, is, does it make sense to just take a macroscopic variable to quantize it and naturally, it will give us micro. Uh, I have great doubts on it, simply because we have seen so many uh, theories which are effective theories, hydrodynamics being one of it, right? And why, why is it that? <laughs> How is it that if you just take any macroscopic variable and quantize it, and you'll get what you want, meaning quantum gravity, okay? So, if you look at the drop-down list here, going from micro to macro, or rather, what we are faced with, the challenge is to go from macro, try to deduce what the microstructure is. And I would call that quantum gravity uh, proper, whereas if you assume that you know the basic constituents, you need to show how the macroscopic structure, like the manifold structure, uh, emerges, okay? So actually I use this emergent, this slide with the emergent word in it much earlier than emergent gravity became popular in a way. Because logically this is what one needs to do, that is from micro showing the macro structure and maybe uh, at the end the macro, uh, the, mi the meso structure and then the macro structure. Now if you look at um, it in the vertical direction, well, then there are 
a, a list of totally different issues uh, that we need to confront, which is similar to what I mentioned, kinetic theory in between, uh, uh, <coughs> between the molecular physics uh, dynamics and hydrodynamics. And, <coughs> and in a couple of slides, I will illustrate uh, at least the way that I would go about trying to sort of unravel or try to understand a little bit about the mesoscopic structure. Another key word is coarse graining, as we all know. Uh, if you're given all the fine grain information, like even the computer printout of the 10 to the 23 molecules in a mole of gas, it's totally useless to look at that printout. What is useless is to say, well, the room is too hot here, okay, temperature, the concept of temperature. So you can see that collective variable actually functions very differently. And if you for one second think about general relativity as a collective variable, then many of the issues uh, that would pop out for you to try to uh, pursue this investigation further would be very different. Uh, and that's what led me to non-equilibrium quantum field theory, okay, by necessity, in fact. So this is the list oops, of uh, issues, coherence, correlations, fluctuations, and stochasticity, collectivity, variability, non-linearity, non-locality. They all would come out, would need to be dealt with sooner or later. All right, so uh, a quick summary of so far, what said so far. Besides quantum, the classical and added conceptual dimension need be included in our consideration from this different perspective, i.e. micro to macro. So this points to the necessity of first identifying the correct micro or meso variables before consideration of quantization. And if I don't have enough time, let me just tell you, there are two routes that I don't know, 20, 30 years ago that I decided. One is fluctuation noise. It's basically garbage, okay? <laughs> whatever is left over, and you look into the garbage can to look for whatever meaningful uh, messages in there. Well, like the detectors, they all do that. Uh, very simple, right, <laughs> as uh, uh, Sherlock Holmes would say. Certainly not very simple. Uh, because these are usually corrupted information, things that we usually consider as noise, uh, not worthy of paying attention to, so on and so forth. Yesterday we heard about relevant versus irrelevant. So here is, of course, you have to define the observer. The observer, like us, live at very low energy scale. And so what is it that we could relate to yet contain some hint about what had happened earlier. Isn't this what cosmology is about? Okay. All right. The other is very important is the role of topology because it's more resistant to environmental decoherence. So the task of emergent versus quantum gravity, uh, I would define top as energy top coming from the Planck scale down. I know this is almost the opposite of many other people's definition. And for emerging gravity, it is to understand, the task is to understand how the macroscopic structure of space-time emerges or evolves from unknown microscopic structures. Whereas quantum gravity uh, is going bottom-up from today's low energy up, how to induce or infer microstructures from macro phenomena. And I must emphasize that this, these are two complementary task. It's not like you can just go from bottom up uh, without any sort of guidance from top down. And similarly, of course, it might be easier to identify the dark target for people working uh, top down with micro to macro because you know what the macro end result is. The challenge there is actually the emergence mechanism, which is totally non-trivial. Uh, if, if I have some time, I would show you a couple of slides, at least the, the difficulties that I could uh, uh, imagine uh, we need to uh, overcome. All right, uh, let me go a little bit faster. Coarse graining, I mentioned. Uh, of course, 
it, that case depends a lot on what you want to see coming out of it, right? Because different core screening measures apply to even the same set of uh, fine uh, grained uh, data would give you very different uh, macroscopic uh, outcomes, okay? And this is something I wrote in 1993 in a conference. And at that time, uh, people were talking about decoherence, uh, like uh, decoherent history, consistent history, uh, environment in, uh, induced uh, decoherence, and so on. And I, I was saying, well, all right, there's a lot of mathematics uh, proposed very, very well. But then the physical outcome depends a lot on the coarse graining measure. And there are two criteria that needs to be uh, checked out. One is the stability with respect to the repetition of the same coarse graining. So it, it starts to stabilize. And then if you vary the coarse graining measure, right, there's certain robustness, okay? And this is, I think, behind also what uh, uh, Gelman, Harto, and uh, later on, uh, Halliwell, Maroff, referred to as the quasi-classical domain and so on. So there's a lot of uh, this kind of thinking that one needs to uh, incorporate uh, when you come down from top uh, uh, the emerging gravity uh, uh, program, okay? So in fact, likely new physics would appear at successive levels of structure. Notice that there's not just one level of structure. I think we might encounter many. Just think about, let's say, something nuclear physics versus QCD. Uh, I remember 50 years ago, people in the <laughs> corridor would say, well, we don't need nuclear theories anymore. Okay, we have QCD. <laughs> is it really true? I mean, even the Hadron forces is not so trivial to derive it from QCD, even if you're given a big computer to do the lattice uh, computation and so on. So be, be mindful that new physics may appear as successive levels of structure, of structure, described by nested set of collective variables from micro to meso to macro structures. And uh, well, in this process, uh, you probably need to take into consideration the back reaction. And if that were the case, it would engender dissipative dynamics, and that's where quantum open system techniques needed. The reason why I venture into these corners, like non-equilibrium uh, that Renata mentioned earlier, or quantum open system, was because of this, okay? It's not enough for me to just keep saying this. We just have to start doing something about it, yeah. All right, another uh, thing is about RG, the, the Romgian group uh, uh, approach, which is, uh, you can see, great work done here, right, by uh, Frank and uh, Renata and Jan. Uh, their group going on for decades, really, it's quite, really admirable. And if you take this viewpoint that there are successive layers of structure, beware that the RG running may not be as smooth throughout as new levels of structure may appear with new collective variables describing new interactions. And coarse graining measures may need to be adjusted with the appearance of each new level of structure. And as I just said, dissipative dynamics uh, from back reaction requires real time non-equilibrium RG. Okay, just, just something in passing. Okay, so these are the things that micro theories uh, would need to work on. Uh, and uh, I would just go quickly, uh, list out a few things, most likely nonlinear, strongly interacting, strongly correlated systems, uh, non-locality property, non-local properties can emerge. It's very involved, right? Um, and in fact, uh, one, th one, <coughs> worth, one thing worth noticing is that <coughs> micro-locality is very different from macro-locality. And even at different levels of structure, the sense, the meaning of locality could change very differently. Meaning that if you are at a different level of structure, looking at the sub-level or the super-level, uh, it would appear to be non-local. So don't be surprised to uh, to see this, and we just have to face it uh, squarely. 
So my attitude is take this equivalence, <coughs> inequivalence of micro and macro locality seriously because there's new physics to be uncovered. <coughs> Excuse me. So our conception and the construct of the macro world may bear little resemblance to the micro world, okay? Uh, as I just said, locality at one level may have little to do with the locality at other levels. And um, so let me just quickly say something about bottom up um, because that's what uh, I think uh, is something possible and I think that's the way that physics has progressed over the centuries. Uh, th because this is some, something that our experimental colleagues are very eager to know. Okay, show me how can I find out whether your uh, theorem or thesis are uh, actually uh, realistic, uh, meaning uh, something that they could check out. Okay, I've said this already. And here's one uh, <laughs> hope. When I look at uh, this mic micro to macro, there are actually uh, parallels, okay? For example, we talk about um, magneto hydrodynamics, and then in QCD, we have magnetochromo hydrodynamics. So the overall structure is quite similar, even though, of course, uh, <coughs> QCD and QED are quite different at the microscopic scale. So there's some hope that maybe we could have some uh, geometro uh, hydrodynamics uh, similar with a similar behavior as some of these better known theories. And as I just mentioned earlier, uh, topological structures uh, because they are more resilient to evolutionary or env environmental changes. And we've seen many excellent work on topological features in manifolds. And also at the same time in the last 10 years, there's a lot of progress in condensed metaphysics of tensor network. And yesterday, there's a talk about tensor network field, tensor field. Uh, I think that's certainly an improvement. And we could also see string nets, auras, bin form, uh, and so on. So those are all very important uh, features. And noise and fluctuations, which is something that I focus on in my research, my own research. So let's get down to the main topic. If we rely on noise and fluctuations, I will give you examples, the three that I mentioned earlier, that you actually need to, it's not sort of free to do so. And there is such a theory called semi-classical stochastic gravity. Uh, the main advantage is that it minimizes speculative assumptions. There's no room for any speculation because it's based on quantum field theory and general relativity, right? And it's a, and it's a natural extension of well-known and tested theories, quantum field theory in curved space time, semi-classical gravity. So <laughs> this is the main theme of part two and three uh, of this talk, which is quantum fluctuations. And the two topics, gravitational decoherence and gravitational entanglement, uh, I think I would have some time to cover. And then the third part is graviton noise, okay. And the theoretical basis for low energy quantum gravity and quantum information uh, phenomena uh, would be the stochastic semi-classical gravity. All right, so this is sort of going back, and a lot of this uh, development came from the mid-90s. Certainly, quantum information took off around those times. And this slide basically compares the area that stochastic gravity started about 94 or so, had been applied to mostly strong field conditions, <coughs> like the early universe or the late stages of black hole collapse. And, uh, <coughs> but interestingly, there's also uh, things going on since the 60s uh, for people focusing on quantum mechanics and trying to change quantum mechanics uh, to explain, for example, the collapse of the wave function, things like that. And this is just to warn <laughs> people that the semi-classical uh, gravity defined here is very different from the semi-classical gravity, uh, the terminology used in this community. That's all, okay? 
All right, so uh, what are they? So these issues, how does environment, uh, uh, environmental effect affect the quantum coherence of a system, right? And how an entangled state evolves under the influence of its environment. So this certainly gets into the emergent field of relativistic quantum information, where relativistic refers to either special or general relativity. Even simple things like time dilation play some role uh, when we look at quantum information issues in this relativistic context. Okay. And the gravitational decoherence that I refer to is specifically by noises of gravitational origin. Okay. And the gravitational cat state comes from the entangling between two masses, uh, a topic I mentioned earlier that's caught a lot of attention uh, recently. Okay. All right, so let's get on to it. And if you are interested in some of the references of gravitational decoherence, you can see it here. And um, I just want to point out that already there, are, uh, there have been gravitational decoherence theories or theories like that, uh, like the DOC Penrose, even though Penrose never want to use uh, deco the word decoherence, and Garadi, Rimini, Weber, and Pearl, and Bassi, uh, the continuous collapse, okay? Um, I want to mention this because you see in a moment that if you adhere to uh, general relativity and quantum field theory, even though taking the weak field limit and the non-relativistic limit, uh, you will get something totally different from what the alternative quantum theorists uh, would like to see, actually, all right? So a second point is that the noise is from the weak gravitational perturbations of Minkowski space. So these are the only dynamical or propagating degrees of freedom, and they are the gravitons, okay? Not the Newtonian force. All right, so what we found is that, uh, let me just, skip this and give you the first equation <laughs> in the talk, which of course, this is the Einstein-Hilbert action and then this is this uh, massive scalar field as an example. And you see the mass equation is Markovian in nature. This is the simple Liouvillean form and this is just the tensor projection operator on PI, PI. These are the momentum, right? So if you combine them all together, you get simply just p square here. So the decoherence is actually in the energy basis, p square over 2m, uh, in the non-relativistic uh, case, of course, is the energy. It's not in the configuration space basis as the alternative quantum theorists uh, would like to see. And the reason they want to see that is simply, well, we know that below a certain scale, the system behaves quantum mechanically, right? But then above a certain scale, it behaves classically. So let's find that scale. So if you want decoherence to work for this purpose, you say that it decoheres at that scale. And then we, well here, we came along and did some calculation. We referring to Anastopoulos and also Miles Blanco. Obviously, uh, for someone who understands general relativity, it's the energy uh, that mediates the interaction. So. This is the first point. The second thing to pay attention to is this capital theta parameter. It's, uh, there are two alternatives. If you go by the Minkowski space-time as the lowest energy microstate, then that's a Planck scale, and you can see that there's just no chance you can see that this is a big number, and the decoherence time is really short, right? Uh, and however, if you think that what we see today is a macro state of the collective variables, okay? Well then, uh, this, you can set this theta to be much lower and hence a greater chance for you to see gravitational decoherence effect. So if you're an optimist, if someday, uh, well, it takes a lot of work because you need to isolate the other influencing factors primarily from electromagnetic forces, of course, right? And w if one day you can come close to identifying that this is indeed uh, a gravitational decoherence effect, 
then maybe you, maybe you can turn this around and use the decoherence time to infer whether gravity is fundamental, meaning at the Planck scale and all that, the quantum effect shows up in the, in the Planck scale or uh, emergent. So what we use, of course, was the, uh, the sort of ubiquitous model, the quantum Brownian motion. So if you think uh, for a second about quantum Brownian motion acting as an environment to decohere a quantum system, there are at least two parameters. One is the temperature, obviously. The other one is the spectral density. So what is the spectral density? It's kind of a mesoscopic uh, structure um, <laughs> for different collection of uh, harmonic oscillators. You can actually uh, design different spectral uh, density functions for your different environments. And here, this theta is characteristic of the spectral density of what environment? The graviton environment. So uh, I coined this word, the texture of space time. It's not quite the micro, but at least it's something uh, reflective of the collective uh, action of the environment on the system. So if you're an optimist, one day gravitational decoherence may also reveal the textures of space time. All right, so let me get to gravitational cat state and another uh, list of references. So let's start from something really simple. If you want to construct a gravitational cat state, let's say one mass located at minus x, the other one at plus x, okay? Right away, you know that semi-classical gravity doesn't work. It's not sufficient for quantum information since it gives the mean value of the stress-energy tensor, T mu nu. So you will wrongly conclude that it's right there, it's always there, well, which defeats the whole purpose of an entangled state, right? There's no superposition, no quantum, all right? So quickly, uh, here's the semi-classical Einstein equation, the classical uh, stress energy tensor and the quantum one. And let's say you pick your favorite scalar or quantum field, let's say massive scalar field in this case, and you have to solve these two equations uh, uh, self-consistently, right? So notice this is the expectation value, right, uh, of a stress energy tensor operator. So, well, if semi-classical theory can cope, uh, it does not emit cat states, so the quantum information in the face of gravity really needs to go beyond, okay? So we must include contributions from the fluctuations in quantum matter field in addition to the mean. Fluctuations is just another way to express correlation. So really the important quantity at this level of uh, understanding would be the correlations of the stress energy tensor. They are needed to address issues in quantum information with gravity. And there's such a theory as I just mentioned earlier. And um, let's take a look. So here we have an S. And so the stochastic term appears here. Now, of course, it's not so easy just write down a term in an equation there. Uh, you have to make sure that uh, first of all, uh, an Einstein equation and all that, the marble palace and all that, could never allow any stochastic thing intruding, okay, intrusion. And uh, that took me some years to think through. Uh, what turns out to be the case, of course, the fluctuation is really just another form of the two-point function of stress energy tensor. That's what enters in there. And if you look at this, the einstein langevin equation, because now you have a stochastic term there uh, with the simple case of a perturbed, uh, weakly perturbed uh, <coughs> uh, h mu nu, uh, you would, in general, see non-local dissipation and colored noise. This is what I referred to just uh, moments ago. Okay? We're dealing with a quantum open system. And the two-point function actually is very well-behaved uh, thanks to its uh, well-behaved uh, properties uh, for the stress energy tensor. It's symmetric, traceless, and divergence-free, you know, traceless for conformal fields. So everything is fine. You just have to work a little bit harder with the bi-tensor 
in this case, and that the expectation value of the biotensor is called the noise kernel. So this is really what characterizes the next level up from semi-classical gravity. And it is at this level uh, that we could start investigating quantum information issues like the cat state. Let me just flip through this quickly. Thank you, yeah. So here at L over two minus L over two and then L plus L over two, this is how you form the gravitational cat. And let's say you stick a classical probe there and you can work this out, uh, it's a very simple calculation. And uh, I just want to highlight the most relevant part. Well, if you start with a many body wave function, psi star uh, psi, right? That of course is the number operator. And when you look at this more carefully, you see that, I'm skipping all, all over here, the mu here is actually the uh, mass density right, operator, and we want a two-point function of it. What is this? This is really the zero, zero component of the T mu nu T rho sigma that I was referring to, T mu nu x, T rho sigma x prime. In the simplest form here, uh, you can see it already creeping up, showing up in this uh, simplest uh, gravitational cat state uh, situation. So this is just to show you no, the noise kernel is nothing crazy or nothing uh, sort of uh, uh, ad hoc. Uh, it is a two-point function of your stress energy tensor. And in the simplest case of non relativistic weak field limit, it's your mass density operator. Okay. <clears throat> now, if you put in a quantum probe, well, you'll get Rabi oscillation. So this is something people in quantum optics know very well, uh, albeit here we are using gravitational uh, force uh, for the uh, cat state, right? So the bigger picture, I could show it at the end, <laughs> okay? All right, so let's move on to the third part, um, graviton noise. And the effect of graviton noise on geodesic separation, of course, we need separation uh, for anything uh, gravity. It sort of started when uh, uh, Mollick and Frank Wilczek uh, wrote that paper. Uh, they basically actually follow what I developed since the 90s. Um, uh, it's kind of rigorous way of dealing with noise uh, in the framework of Springer Keldish, closed time path in, in or Feynman Vernon and so on and so forth. So it's, o it's okay, all right? And there are two or three other papers. The one that I'm gonna tell you is the work uh, done a couple of years ago with uh, Professor Cho of Taiwan. Fine, okay. Um, let me skip over this and just show you very quickly, maybe in two minutes, okay, uh, fast track uh, infant functional. Again, starting with the harmonic oscillator, your system, one harmonic oscillator interacting with n harmonic oscillators bilinearly because uh, we could solve this exactly. And I usually want to try out something wherein we could find exact solutions before I check on everybody else's result and find out where exactly uh, some approximations uh, were introduced, okay? To see the physical viability of whatever conclusion uh, being drawn, okay? So, um, if you group all the environmental variables together, you can form this influence functional. So it's just, you can see all the Q variables are all now functionally integrated. And this is the closed time path um, uh, integration. And this is known as the influence action. So everything is proportional to X now. The reason why you see X plus and minus, if you think the Schwinger Keldish or the closed time pathway one is forward in time, one is backward in time. But usually when I teach non-equilibrium quantum field theory, I would introduce the Feynman Vernon because it's easier to see, for example, when you construct a density matrix, you take two wave functions and do it, construct an operator. What does that show? You have an X and X prime immediately. And then because it's the brass and cat is a cat going 
uh, forming an operator. You can see that one is progressing forward in time, the other is backward in time. So, thank you, yeah. Right, so, without further ado, so if you do it this way, you'll have a two by two uh, green function with all the favorite things in there. But uh, noticeably, uh, it is not the Feynman propagator as we uh, often does in the in-out formulation. And if you put in here, you can identify uh, these two terms. Delta is the difference, uh, sigma is the sum of the <coughs> S and S prime in this case. And sandwich in between there, the delta and the delta is the nu. And it's here that Feynman Vernon introduced a Gaussian identity whereby you can introduce a, a probability distribution P of C and a new function, the C, the noise term. So this is all identical. There's nothing put in by, by hand. And it's only after that that I got, uh, I, I, I was more happy or happier to actually uh, adopt a stochastic uh, interpretation of this theory. So with that, you have the large van equation and uh, the variation of the influence action gives you the large van equation, which is of course something quite familiar, uh, except of course all these are now non-local kernels. So moving forward to the case of graviton noise acting on um, geodesic separations. Let me skip this. I'm just showing in these three slides. There are three different cases, and they are quite similar in nature. And so let's go straight to the <laughs> graviton action right there, right? And then the normal coordinate set up along the geodesic of the first mass, we define the origin of that on one mass and the other mass, of course, we have this geodesic separation. And you can see that under these sort of uh, low energy uh, non physic conditions, it's really the Riemann tensor, zero i, uh, j zero, and so on. So let me show you uh, the result. You do the same thing like the quantum Brownian motion example I gave you. And then you see the dissipation and the noise kernel, right, between the two uh, uh, difference variables. And it looks a little bit complicated, tensors, but it serves the same function. And here's the noise kernel, right? So that's the noise term, which you will see. Uh, this is the stochastic effective action after you've introduced the noise. And then taking the variation, you see the Langevin equation in the same you know, form as what I show you for quantum Brownian motion. So what we did after setting up the initial conditions, we try out, so this is the geodesic separation correlation given mainly by, driven by the noise kernel. And then we try out three different vacua. Minkowski vacuum, uh, no surprise, the effect is minuscule really small. Uh, high temperature, yes, you can get a little bit improvement, but usually high temperature is difficult to identify this uh, gravitational aspect anyway. And finally, the squeeze state, there's some hope because you can propose whatever, uh, the universe had gone, undergone tremendous expansion inflation, and you get a large enough squeeze param parameter here to magnify the effect. And so that's basically what we've done. Conclusion, uh, for this uh, last part, the quantum effect of graviton can manifest a noise on the detector. The vacuum, the, the effect is too small. Same for thermal state, but for the squeeze state, there is a possibility in detecting the primordial gravitons from the inflationary era. And finally, the summary for this whole talk, uh, or the second part of it, um, quantum fluctuations in gravity, noise enters in decoherence processes, correlations enters in entanglement processes, and graviton noise effect on geodesic deviations. And uh, classic semi-classical gravity is a reliable theoretical basis for low energy quantum gravity
and quantum information phenomena. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much for reminding us about the really difficult questions and uh, we were treated to you know, three for the price of one, <laughs> I guess, in terms of information density. Can I invite questions from the audience? Yes, I was caught by your statement that we first have to identify the microscopic variables and then go through the quantization procedure. So is there any way to bypass knowing the right variables without doing quantization? Oh, I, I, was, I heard only a part of that. So you're saying that can we bypass identifying the micro variable and is there any chance that we know beforehand that these are the right variables before going through the program of quantization and showing that it works? If you think about um, uh, high energy physics in the 50s, not the 60s, okay, before quark came into our consciousness, what have people been doing, right? Proton, proton scattering, all the things that we could do. And as I said, um, we really need help from both sides, people working very hard to find contradictions. And on that point, I've been telling younger people, don't rush into Q cross G. It's very difficult, of course, there are still many <laughs> successful cases. But even with Q plus G, because of the intrinsic contradictions between quantum and gravity, there's a lot of things that we could think about, right? So it's, it's similar to in the late 50s, early 60s in particle physics, what people were thinking about, the anomalies and strange behavior and so on. On the other hand, there's this genius, uh, self-proclaimed genius at least, uh, which is true, Gelman, I said, the A4 way, okay? And he started working out, and that seems to match some of the resonances that they detected. I think it's a painstaking road, but physics has always been going on like that, right? From atomic physics to nuclear physics to uh, particle physics, yeah. Daniel, is that? Yeah. Hi, hi <laughs> yes, for <Hello. laughs> Interceptors. Good. Intercepted microphone. Go well, ahead, go ahead. Um, so yeah, th thanks Bella for, for this talk and I agree with you that like this quantum fluctuation, you know, this quadratic quantum fluctuation is really a, a key that we, we need to look more into in quantum gravity. Now, uh, it sounds like a technical question, but I'm a bit surprised by one aspect that doesn't seem to appear in, in, your, in your derivation, which is that, you know, my little experience with this two-point fluctuation of the energy momentum tensor, especially at coincident point, is that it's rigged with UV divergences. Can you speak a little bit slow? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So it's the problem of the, the problem with this, you know, um, I mean, or one issue that I, I see with this two-point function of the energy momentum tensor, and that's an opportunity for us, is that it is rigged with ultraviolet divergences, right? So this two-point function is, in fact, infinite in usual quantum field no, theory. No, they're actually fin they're finite, actually. Uh, they are, of course, distributions, but all the divergences are contained in the T mu nu. So if you have some way to regularize it, it's okay. But, that's ex but in some sense, that's what we need quantum gravity for. What we need quantum gravity for is to find a proper UV regularization of this two-point function of the energy momentum tensor. And, and if I understand properly, the, the relationship of the, between the two-point function and the one-point function you know, defines the diffusion constant. So I would say this is somehow quantum gravity observable, the way that things is regularized. Anyway, what I want to say is that, you know, naively, this, this object is not small, it's infinite, and therefore uh, it gives us a leeway that it might be bigger than we naively expect. Right. Uh, well, in general, I could respond this way. Uh, I would look at this from the whole hierarchy of correlation functions, and this is just one step going from the expectation value of stress energy tensor to the two-point function. Or you can also continue on with the endpoint function. 
already, as I said, the two-point function, there's no divergence if you regularize well enough the stress energy tensor. Yeah. We'll have to chat about it. Okay, one final question, Daniele. So you said that the, uh, the coherence scale for gravitational decoherence uh, is not necessarily the Planck scale if you don't come from the quantum gravity uh, and instead you take the point of view of emergent gravity. Do we, have a, do we have a theoretical estimate of what could be that scale? Right, that capital theta factor, right? Uh, that, of course, depends a lot on what kind of emergent theory. Uh, and that in turn depends on what you start out with, like strings, spin nets, and so on and so forth. So one would expect the, you know, our, our colleagues working on those things at some point present, for example, the mesoscopic structure. And we could then compare it with the spectral density function of this, uh, let's say, harmonic oscillator or whatever environment there is, and then see if we could narrow down to the range uh, that's uh, physically feasible, yeah. I think we'll have to move on. Keep all your good and hard questions for the next break for Bailaku and let us thank him very much again for his talk. Thank you.